So, good morning, everybody. Welcome to West London Chambers of Commerce Financial Webinar on the 21st of September 2023. I know most people are expecting to tune in and see the happy, smiling face of Sally Smith, um, but she's been called away, so you have to put up with me. My name's Alan Rides. I'm the CEO of the Chamber. We put up with all of the rain yesterday, and now we've got some blue sky and sunshine. So to um, talk us through some of the darker points of a um, COVID crisis and now cost of living crisis, um, we've got some financial experts um, who are going to talk through how different businesses can have some options of coming out of COVID into uh, an open, brighter, wider world and um, see how the economy is trying to recover um, past this COVID pandemic um, in the new world where we have a race for growth. Um, our high street footfall is growing um, locally. We're up to pre-pandemic levels, but there's a squeeze on business with finances. Um, before COVID, um, we had a British Business Bank formed by a former local MP, Sir Vincent Cable. Um, so we are very proud to have them with us and giving us some opening comments. Um, together with them, we have speakers from Barclays Bank and some private sector finance companies who will tell us um, how things can work from their perspective. Um, they're from um, Inventis and from RHM Advisory. So we welcome them. Plus, we have our award-winning Oasis accountants, courtesy of Prashant Yadav, who will be telling us all about how your accountant can give you some valuable advice before you go looking for finance. Can everybody please turn on their cameras to say hello to our audience today? as they slowly all load up. Good morning, Prashant. Good morning, Good morning everybody. David. Morning, Richard. Morning. Uh, morning, James. If only yeah. everybody was coming to us from a sunny island in the Caribbean, like Richard is. I wish. <laughs> it's amazing what you can do with the wonders of Zoom. Um, so, um, we, as local businesses, um, our Chamber of Commerce mainly focuses on SME businesses that gradually aspire to move up the chain to become medium-sized business. And to do that, the biggest thing that they have to move away from is getting financed from um, friends, family, and I've forgotten what the last F is. Um, maybe I shouldn't say it. Um, but... Um, that they, they then need to move into the world of how do you develop trade finance for your business, not just to rely on your own personal finances. And that properly develops growth as your turnover builds over a million mark and gets in the tens of billions. But in today's world, um, with the Bank of England pushing up interest rates higher and higher to try and drive down inflation, um, the cost of loans and finance has become more expensive. So um, to talk through some of the options and what the wonderful British Business Bank can do to help with a big smile on his face, we have today with us, David Woods. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks, um, would, you, would you please like to tell us how the British Business Bank can work towards us? And I, I should also quickly say a good morning to Kuldeep, who just managed to join us in time from Barclays Bank. Good morning, Colby. You're still on mute. You're still on mute. Okay, David, please please <laughs> carry on while you're there. I'll go for it. Um, so thank you for having me. It's good to be here. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the British Business Bank and some of the things we have to try and help businesses as they grow from startup through their journey. 
Um, I need to start at the beginning with the advice from our lawyers, which is to say that we're not regulated or authorised by the FCA, which means that nothing within this presentation should be taken as financial advice. Please consult an expert. So now that's out of the way. So the British Business Bank is an economic development bank. So we're not a high street lender. You can't just walk into a branch and ask us for a loan or a bank account. That's not what we do. We're owned by the government, but we run independently of it. So if you're a business and you can access finance uh, from whatever lender and provider you wish in whatever format you wish, then that's brilliant. The market's working exactly as it should do for you. However, if there's a part in your business journey where you can't access finance in the format that you want from the provider that you want, that's the point that we aim to try and help them make the market work better for you. So we run a range of different programs to target different parts of the market for different parts of your business journey. Now, since legally we can't lend directly with the SME, we appoint legally accredited delivery partners. So we currently work with around 200. These range from high street banks like our colleagues in the webinar from Barclays through to local lenders. And we work with some angels and some VCs and some platform lenders. And the way that the programs work, you just you go to the delivery partner of your choice and then they can lend and invest more money because of the programs that we run. So one of the things I get asked is why we're supporting SMEs. There's five and a half million in the UK, which is a lot. They employ 16 and a half million people. That's 61% of all the jobs within the private sector. And it's about 50% of the total UK private sector turnover. So to give you some context of how hard the bank works to support these businesses, we've currently got 12 billion pounds of finance in these markets, supporting these SMEs through their various business journeys. Now, we run quite a few different programs and I'm constrained within time, so I can't detail everything, but possibly one of the more relevant ones and certainly my favorite is startup loans. So if you're a company that's traded for less than three years, you've probably got no assets, you've probably got a limited profit, it is unlikely you're gonna be able to access commercial finance because you're not a particularly great risk for most lenders. However, we own the startup loans company. So we will lend each director of the business to a maximum of four directors between £500 and £25,000. So in theory, you can borrow £100,000 for your business if there's four of you. We don't ask for a huge great deal of paperwork, but what we need is a cash flow forecast, a business plan and survival budget, all of which we've got as templates on our website, which you can download. It's a very simple process. If you go onto our site, then you click for the startup loans page. There's a pre-screening portal page and you fill in a couple of questions. And then depending on where you are and the sector you're in, you'll be assigned a delivery partner. And the delivery partner will talk to you and then work out what you want to do with the money, how much you want to borrow and help you basically and hold your hand through the process to make sure that actually everything's in place. So it works out exactly as you want. Uh, loans are from a one year to a five year term. You can repay it early if you like. It's a fixed rate of interest currently of 6%. If you need a few ideas about what you could do with it, we have lots and lots of case studies of various different people that have accessed them to try and give you some help and advice. Um, we've just passed the one billion pound mark in terms of startup loans. So it's a really successful product and we've got lots and lots of SMEs that we help support with it. So. My role within the bank is a little unusual. There's a team of 13 of us covering the UK and Northern Ireland. Uh, I work within the M25 for the bank. So if you imagine London's like a jigsaw puzzle, and then you've got all these people that see all the different pieces. So I get to work with banks and brokers and VCs and angels and chambers of commerce and lawyers and accountants. And everybody gives me a little tiny piece of the puzzle. And then eventually we can assemble this whole jigsaw puzzle of what London looks like and what's working and what isn't working. And then that allows us to target our resources within different regions more effectively. So if you don't need the finance that we've got, that's brilliant because the market's working for you. That's exactly what we want. But in terms of other things that we have and resources you can access, if you're at the very early point and you don't know what kind of finance options you might need, we have a finance finder on the hub and it asks you six simple questions, and then it will give you a list of things in terms of finance products that might be a good fit for you. It stars them because we can't tell you exactly which one will fit because we don't have that data and we're not legally allowed to. But And then it will guide you towards 
resources that can tell you about what you need. And then you can go and find someone who's qualified and able to actually help you through the process. If you're looking for grants, we've got a link to the government's grant finder tool. So that will tell you all the grants that the government's aware of across the UK. And there's also a link to their support for SME page, which lists other things that might help you in your journey. If you haven't come across the Help to Grow scheme, it's really, really good. It's government funded. Uh, it's run through universities and it's like a mini MBA. So we've got some details on that and the providers. If you're looking for equity, we've got guides to angel investing and being investor ready for the kind of the VC path and how you get pitch decks and things. If you just want some simple advice about how to help your business grow, we've got a partnership with the Open University. So there's free courses you can access online. You don't have to be uh, you don't have to be a client of ours. You don't have to borrow any money. You can just go onto the startup loans page and it's linked through there and then you can access the courses. And I guess the last point, because I'm conscious of time, um, we've got a green growth hub. So about 18 months ago, we went out and talked to SMEs and intermediaries and we asked them about net zero and the kinds of things that you might want to access as an SME, where you could get financial help, where you can get knowledge and kind of connectivity. And we've collated all that information onto one page on our site. So now we've got a very simple explanation of what net zero is, what the benefits are for your business of actually doing something now, and case studies which show you other people and the things that they've done and maybe give you some ideas of where you can go with it. Um, that's a very quick, high-level view of what the bank does. And um, hopefully that's kind of been very helpful. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, David. He says quickly looking to make sure he's not unmuted. And he is unmuted. All right. <laughs> um, it's very interesting. I I'm sure a lot of people haven't heard from or about the British Business Bank before. Um, we'll have a chance to take questions at the end. Um, so please let those build up in the Q&A um, if you can. Um, our next speaker is Prashant Yadav for the newly rebranded Oasis Accountants, um, who will be giving a bit of a backdrop on uh, what companies should look at internally on their own balance sheet uh, and uh, some different options from an accountant's perspective of the finances that are available and financiers that are available out there. Prashant, over to you. Yeah, good morning, everyone, and uh, really excited to speak to you. And uh, thank you for investing your time. You know, as everybody is, uh, you know, concerned about the cost of living crisis and uh, generating the revenue, raising the finance. So it's really good of you to invest time. I'll just share the screen and uh, give uh, some information about us. So just give me a moment. Yeah, so just a bit about ourselves. Uh, uh, we are Oasis Accountants, uh, and uh, uh, as Alan mentioned, we just rebranded ourselves. Uh, we completed a decade of uh, our accountancy services uh, in Jan 2023, and uh, we just wanted to have a you know a fresh look and you know and also energy uh, to focus for the next uh, couple of decades. Uh, we are based in Chiswick Business Park. It's uh, uh, very close uh, to Hammersmith and Gunnersbury. Uh, as I mentioned, we have been operating uh, 10 years and we have evolved as a business. Uh, we have been uh, not just providing the accountancy services, obviously accountancy services are our main business, where we support small and medium-sized businesses, startup businesses uh, who have started, so we advise them uh, in terms of what kind of structure they should have, uh, what side of finance they should raise, and uh, various different things. And we, we support like start to end accounting work. We also have a wealth management company where we advise on various wealth management products, insurance, pensions, and investments. Uh, we have uh, also an umbrella company uh, due to IR35, which came into the effect uh, last couple of years. And uh, there were contractors uh, by big companies who were asked to work inside IR35. So we support that sector as well. And we also have 
like uh, estate planning, where we do the wills, lasting power of attorney. Uh, so it's really like when a business starts making money, we advise them to save and invest. And when they're saved and invest, you know, we ask them to protect that money and obviously you know, pass that as an inheritance uh, to their loved ones. Uh, obviously, everybody is aware that uh, you know, cost of uh, finance is very high because of inflation, because of uh, bank of uh, interest rates, uh, you know, getting high, and uh, there are likely uh, whether bank of interest rates might raise uh, rate uh, uh, in the current months. So. It's not easy uh, to raise a finance, especially for an existing companies. Uh, and more importantly, the cost of finance is also very high, uh, highly available. So what are the what are the things what a business can think uh, within their businesses? You know, there are different uh, you know, opportunities available to have a look. And uh, obviously, you need to look a little bit more in detail. Uh, crisis after crisis has been happening last five years, like, you know, we have uh, you know, brick exit, we have, uh, you know, COVID, we have a cost cost of living crisis and multiple businesses have been impacted. And obviously, you know, businesses with the time, they need to pivot uh, their model and they need to see, you know, what can be managed uh, internally before they start looking externally. A smart debt management. So usually a business should not be uh, accruing their debts, uh, you know, more than 90 days. If your debts are accruing, accrued more than 90 days, uh, there are chances that some of the debts might not be collected. So uh, why don't business think about uh, giving uh, some kind of a discounting to make some early payment? So maybe it, it could be a 5% discount for an early payment. It could be 7% or a 10% discount. Wh whatever doesn't reduce your profit margin, uh, as long as you can collect your debts on time. It's effective cash management where you get a cash flows in time instead of depending on an extra borrowing like old drafts or extra finance, which obviously has a higher cost at the moment. Uh, maintaining the second point is uh, your cash reserves. So some of the businesses would have a cash reserves, accumulated profits from the previous years. So maybe you can uh, you know, cut down the dividends and maintain that reserves. Maybe you can invest that reserves in using your own cash reserves uh, for reinvestment using your own cash reserves for uh, making a new marketing and sales plan where you can uh, have uh, you know more revenues of your revenue because obviously uh, again time and time and I'm raising this point that uh, finance is available but obviously it's costly so why don't you use your current reserves or current resources where you don't have to shell that extra uh, level of cost uh, where businesses are managing inventory, uh, obviously, you need to relocate and see, you know, which are the inventories which are not effectively selling and, uh, you know, what could you do better to sell your inventory better, which is the inventory which is would be a waste or would be outdated uh, if you don't, you know, sell it in time. So just need to relocate a <clears throat> couple of your internal inventory and have a look uh, how you can effectively, you know, sell your inventory and generate that extra uh, cash flows. Uh, obviously, as I mentioned, because of the crisis, when, when the revenues are coming, obviously you would like to spend more, you want to expand more, you want to, you know, uh, you know more, uh, you know, hire more. But obviously, uh, when the revenues are a challenge or uh, when, when it's difficult for you to connect, uh, you know, collect the revenue on time, you need to relook in your accounts that how can you curtail the non-essential cost? Uh, you know, you should just uh, check your accounts quite regularly. Uh, it should not be a year-end affair. It should be like every month, every quarter. Check your financials. Check what's coming in. And whatever you're spending, especially the variable cost, whatever variable cost you're spending, whether you can cut down some of the variable cost, which is not generating a revenue for you. So it's very important to have a look and cut down some of your non-essential costs where you can maintain some of your cash reserves. Uh, many of businesses might have uh, accrued the liabilities of HMRC uh, where uh, there would be a challenge uh, to make a, a payment uh, for those. It would be corporation tax liabilities. It could be PAY liabilities. It could be VAT liabilities. It could be even for the directors and the owners, it could be like self-assessment uh, liabilities. So HMRC is flexible. 
uh, they have been flexible, but communication is very important. You know, you, you make sure that you communicate with HMRC and you file your returns on time. So they are agreeing the payment plan, but before you agree a payment plan, they want your returns to be filed on time and uh, they want whatever you honor, uh, whatever you agree for the payment plan, you, you pay it on time. But there is a facility available. If you have a 50 grand to pay to HMRC or 70 grand to pay to uh, HMRC, and if you have a situation in your business where you uh, don't have that uh, money available, you might have that money available in three months time or five months time. If you file your returns on time, communicate with HMRC and I'm, you know they are giving the payment plan. So that is one of the way where you can manage your cash flow effectively. Uh, suppliers, uh, obviously I mentioned about variable cost and obviously there are fixed cost and some of the fixed cost you can't avoid. Uh, check with your suppliers, what are the different payment plans you can have with them? Uh, whether you can extend some of the credits, what you have. And if you have a, a credit of 30 days, maybe you can extend it to 45 days or maybe 60 days uh, or, uh, or even more if, if your orders are a little bit bigger. So it's very important to communicate with the suppliers and uh, you know make sure that you have some kind of a payment plan so that actually saves some of your cash flow within the company. But most important thing is to communicate. If you have got a letter from a supplier of a non-payment and if you have not communicated to that, uh, you know there are a lot of businesses who are getting letters from the data collection agencies because of non-communication that is going through a debt collection. And obviously debt collection on top of that is charging more extra uh, charges. So that's that becomes an extra burden for a business. So please don't avoid any letters if you've got from HMRC or suppliers, talk to them, uh, explain to them about your business situation, make a payment plan. And obviously, you know, they will agree as long as you're communicated and honored your payment plan. Uh, what are the different options of raising uh, you know, uh, some of the cash flow in the business, what could be cheaper than what's available currently in the market? It could be intercompany loans. So there are group companies and maybe some of the you know, subsidiary companies are doing well. They have good, good reserves in the, uh, in the balance sheet. You know, those money can be lent. And obviously that is not a free money that has to be paid as an interest, but obviously that interest rates will be a little bit cheaper. But that's like one avenue of raising the money uh, from uh, either a subsidiary or either uh, any any company which is available in the market, which understand your business, which understand the potential of your growth of your business, which is willing to lend you at a cheaper rate. And obviously that can help your you know, working capital and a cash flow. Uh, friends and family loans, if any, any of your, any of the business, uh, friends and families, if they are willing to lend some money, for a shorter period of time and uh, at a cheaper interest rates, you know, that could also have a uh, working capital for a shorter period of time in the company. Uh, R&D tax credits, uh, I think one of our speaker is going to speak more about that, so I'll speak less. Uh, so R&D tax, tax credit, especially if you're a, a profit-making company, uh, let's take an example of an 100 grand spend. Uh, obviously, you're reinvesting in your business so that you can have uh, new avenues of growth. You can improve your current, uh, you know, systems and resources. So any profit-making company who is spending like a hundred grand uh, would get around like around twenty-one thousand five hundred uh, corporation tax saving. Uh, so any of your any of the companies which is reinvesting, then again, as you're saving in the corporation tax, that's like extra twenty-one thousand five hundred available for you uh, in in your cash flows. If you're a loss-making company. Uh, obviously, and if you have spent for your R&D, HMRC will give you back. So taking the same example of 100,000, you would get in the range of 18,500. There are some changes which has come into effect in April. Uh, and this, this amounts what I'm referring to is because of those changes. Uh, the last point is about uh, a pension. So there are two types of pensions available. One is a SIP pension, one is a SARS pension. So SARS pensions, uh, when uh, individual is contributing, uh, you know, you could you could lend if, for example, if you have a pension board of 200,000 and, uh, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're investing in, in a commercial office, you can get like a 50% loan from a SaaS pension for that. Uh, SaaS pension is also available for you to take a business loan for your business uh, at cheaper interest rates. So intercompany loans, friends and family loans, 
uh, funds available from a SaaS pension bonds. These are like available options available if you require some short term and mid long term you know capital uh, for the cash flow management. And obviously within the business, within the business you have so many uh, you know resources out out, uh, out there available where if you can look in deeply, if you can monitor them on a on a monthly basis, on a quarterly basis, you can make your cash flow. Uh, effective and obviously you can keep your business not just running but making sure your business grows and your business thrives wonderful uh, if, thank you very thank very you. much prashant you're thank very you. kind to do such a wonderful presentation thank you um so our next speaker is james baverstock from inventis um who's going to talk about r d tax credits and lots of other wonderful things that he can do to make your business smile over to you, James. Okay, I can see your eyes focusing very hard on your screen, James. And here we go. Okay. There you go. Can everyone uh, see that? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so, um, yeah, thanks for the introduction, Alan. A bit of background um, about Invenix. So uh, we're an innovation funding consultancy. Uh, we're based in Canary Wharf, but I'm actually uh, in, in Hammersmith. So that's how me and Alan formed the connection. And what I'm here to do is, is is speak about a particular area of innovation funding, um, which is R&D tax credits. So um, R&D tax credits, as previously mentioned, is a government incentive to encourage innovation within the UK. So it allows a business to recoup on the costs incurred when completing technically challenging work. So a business can look back at the cost incurred two years retrospectively from their financial year end as well as every financial year going forward. It was just touch on about, about the benefits difference uh, in a small company and, and large company. Obviously, we're going to be focusing on the, the small, medium-sized companies. So it can be between 18 to 33% of the qualifying expenditure. The rates have changed um, for costs that are incurred after April 2023, but we'll go into a little bit more detail about that later on in presentation so um, in terms of how you actually qualify businesses from all different industries can qualify but in general you're trying to meet two criteria which is that the the work that you've done over a financial year is technically uncertain and has some type of technical advancement so when it comes to technical uncertainty the signs of an uncertainty exist where at the start of the project there's a question mark over its feasibility and therefore it's not actually clear how you would proceed. So the technical challenge for the business would be there's no easy and ready-made answers and it makes it necessary for a business to investigate, analyze, iterate designs, run trials, et cetera. Um, the way I explain to clients is that the answers aren't available in the public domain. So you couldn't Google the the answer to the project that you're, that you're trying to complete. And obviously the nature of business is you couldn't ring up and, and ask your competitors how to, how to complete the project. Technical advancement, the signs of, it, uh, of an advancement exist where the company has demonstrated to extend knowledge or capability within a, a, a field of science or tech, developed a new product, process, material, device, service, et cetera made a appreciable improvement to an existing product, process, material, et cetera. Um, the other thing worth noting is sometimes you, as a business, will complete technically challenging work, or you might even tender for work and, 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 and not receive the contract. These failed projects or not completed projects can still be used for R&D claims, so that's also important to bear in mind. Uh, not all work needs to qualify. So HMRC recognized that businesses can be innovative without being a science or research-based organization. If some of your work is routine, that doesn't mean that you can't claim. It just means that you can't claim against that particular element of your business. So you're going to be claiming against cost of the qualifying projects, and this will be reasonably justified in the technical report that gets submitted to HMRC. 
what costs actually qualify. So you, we can look at a myriad of costs. So that would be staff costs, externally provided workers, subcontractors, software costs, consumables, and utilities. Um, here is an example of, a, of an R&D calculation where if you look on the left hand side, it's the cost categories that we just went over, for instance, staff costs, consumables, etc. A breakdown of, um, of how it would work in practice where what is listed is a total amount spent by a company, but not all of that actually gets gets claimed. So you have a R&D percentage that's applied to these cost categories. And that leaves your uh, your qualifying expenditure. And of that qualifying expenditure, that is what you receive the benefit on. So as uh, as mentioned, the rates vary in terms of how much that of that qualifying expenditure th that you can actually recoup. So the, the, the factors that come into play is if you're profit making, if you're loss making, if we're looking at the retrospective claim, so therefore it would um, have the, the more lucrative rate for an SME, or if we're looking at costs that are after April 2023. But here you can, you can see that um, there is potential that from a, a, a cost pool of £338,000 there, it would be a uh, roughly £111,000 benefit. Um, R and D in the news and the, and the changes to the incentive. Um, some of you who, who may claim or 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 au fait with, with with this sector may have seen that HMRC has noted an increase in fraudulent claims. Um, there has been, uh, in their opinion, abuse of the scheme, and it's occurred through business owners not being um, not being clued up, being being slightly ignorant ignorant to the incentive, and of course pop up providers being um, opportunistic. So the Times actually published a report saying that HMRC has written to around 80 claims companies, warning that they're going to be reported to the Advertising Standards Authority if they continue with what they call inaccurate and misleading adverts to promote R&D tax credits. So uh, a few red flags for, for you to look out for when, when providers are approaching you. Um, if, providers, if providers are boasting of a 100% submission rate um, whilst not mentioning inquiry rates or unsuccessful inquiries, if they emphasize the fact that they're sitting on a, an advisory board at HMRC, if they're insistent that they're to be paid up front for their work, um, if they don't accept liability for the claim and don't include a, a free and full defense as, as part of um, the, the claim that they provide for you. Um, the consequences of HMRC tackling this fraud is, uh, as, as we mentioned a couple of times, and, and one of the previous speakers did, is that um, the SME scheme was found to have the most non-compliant and fraudulent claims. And so that has, uh, unfortunately, sort of a, um, a few bad eggs have, have sort of spoiled it for the rest of us type of thing. And that's been made less lucrative from, from April 23, whereas the large company scheme has actually been made uh, more lucrative from April 23. So HMRC are bolstering their process for inquiry, meaning that now more than ever, it's important that a business that's, that's currently claiming has to make sure that their process is watertight and there's also a uh, additional information form um, that is in play as of the 8th of August this year. So here is a slightly more in-depth breakdown of if you had £100 worth of qualifying expenditure previously um, for your two retrospective years costs that were incurred before April 1st, 23, um, the, 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 in different scenarios, and then incurred after April 1st, 23. So whilst there has been a reduction, it's not as drastic as people think because corporation tax obviously has increased. So in the case here that you're, um, that, that you're a, a, a higher profit making uh, SME, um, the difference is actually only a, a few pounds um, per, per 100 pounds spent. But regardless, um, it's, it's, it's still an incentive worth taking advantage of. Um, so it leads me to the next point. Don't be put off claiming. So even though there will be increased scrutiny, the government are actually investing money into in innovation incentives and want UK businesses to take advantage of the funding and for the UK to maintain competitive with the rest of the world. As you can see, there's been a 26 percent increase on um, the UK government's in investment into innovation. Um, and it's important that you explore uh, your innovation funding options um, with, a, with a trusted advisor. So. Um, if you uh, want to get in touch, my email address is there. And if um, uh, you have any questions, I know 
because we're pushed for time, I, you know, I, I couldn't get into things that, that people may want to uh, to ask in terms of the specifics around how your industry actually may qualify, how long the process is, what your benefit could be. And if you're a current claimer, you might have questions around, you know, what your potential exposure to an inquiry would be. Is there a way to um, uplift your claim? Um, you know, is there a potential for you to get a grant funding above and beyond R&D and, and things like that? So if anyone does want to reach out, then, um, yeah, then, then feel free. Wonderful. Thank you very, very much, James. Very illuminating. And what, what's more, you're doing a lot of really good work with one of our members. Hopefully through this webinar, we can multiply that a few times over to get you a few other people that can work out ways of getting money back into their business which is always a good thing. Um, next up, we have Colbeer Sohuta and Sandeep Kataj from Barclays Bank, who I'm very glad you've been able to log in and join us. Um, thank you very much. Please uh, talk through your presentation. The stage is yours. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Alan, for that. I'm just going to see if I can just share my slides, so bear with me. We don't generally tend to use Zoom because Barclays supports Teams, so just bear with me, please. This is where we need some nice background music while you focus, yeah. Colby. I don't know. Guys, I'm sorry. Um, um, at the bottom of the screen, there's a big green button that says share screen. On yeah, the press of the that. Screen. Yeah, so I pressed that. I'm just trying to find my presentation, to be honest. Hold on, let me just see. It's down here. I can see it's here. So sorry, Lisa. Um, I've got my presentation and I just need to do, do I just do desktop? Um, yes, you can do. And the chair. Hopefully, it's nothing inappropriate. Open system preferences. We'll see all of your trade secrets in a minute. <laughs> complete screen. Oh, let's see. Can you see anything? I can't. Um, no, you need to make sure you hit the share blue button at the bottom of the. So you click what screen you want to share, then you hit the big blue mm -hmm. share button. I've got the share screen button. And rather than take loads of time, might have to work without it. Uh -huh. Yeah, so if you hit the share screen button, you've got the correct screen selected, and then you hit the big blue share button at the bottom. Oh. Hello, I'm still on here. Yes, you're still yep. here. Okay. We can't see your screen though. No, I can see my presentation now and I've lost my view. Here is Zoom. Okay. When I'm back, I'm pressing share screen. Pressing desktop. Press share. Okay, we're there. Perfect, I can see it. Oh, Sandy, thank you, Sandy. Appreciate it. Sorry, apologies, everybody, for that. But as you can see, I'm not massively technically uh, whiskered or anything. Um, thank you very much, guys, for bearing with us. Um, my name's Corbia. I'm a business relationship manager with Barclays in the West London area, alongside a team of relationship managers, which also includes my colleague, Sandeep, who you're going to hear from shortly. Now, our role, my role, is uh, to support business, to help them grow, to expand, and to help them with any finance opportunities. And that's what we're going to talk about today. I've actually been with Barclays looking after small businesses for the last 10 years, but with Barclays in total for probably over 30 years. Um, so hopefully we have a vast amount of experience between myself and Sandy, but as a team, we definitely have, um, you know, we've got about 10, 12 people within within our team within the London West area. Um, Sandy, I'm going to just hand over to you. He's going to talk a little bit about, he's going to get the ball rolling. Morning, guys. Uh, my name's Sandy. Um, Cinema School, been, uh, been in Barclays for um, 
quite a while, about five, six years, but I've got about 15 years of banking experience. Uh, we're just going to kind of cover three topics today, uh, invoice financing, term lending, and asset finance. Um, you have to just bear with me because we're here on the phone, so um, the slides might look a little bit different to, to the guys on the um, on the laptops. So uh, I'm going to start off with CREA. Uh, so CREA is a, a fintech platform which is in partnership with Barclays, uh, which essentially provides um, payments and invoice financing. Um, and, and it keeps kind of businesses flowing um, in terms of cash flow support uh, through credit and specifically kind of working with um, particularly working capital requirements. Um, so CREA formed a partnership with Barclays around about three years ago. Um, and essentially one of their main products is invoice financing. Um, so they support companies um, or limited companies or LLPs um, where there is a minimum £100,000 turnover. Um, and the businesses potentially are, are looking to kind of um, fund these invoices basically where they're looking to get paid a, a little bit quicker. Um, so essentially how it works um, is you decide what invoices that you would like to fund. Uh, and these are spread from the shorter term or the longer term um, in terms of frequency. So, for example, you would be looking to uh, finance either a seasonal invoice in terms of a, a one-off one, or you would have a, a more of a monthly requirement. Um, the, the costs are quite transparent. Uh, the application process is very fairly easy to set up. Um, so how it works is you would provide the invoice to us um, in uh, an application, uh, upload it, uh, and then we would kind of get CREA to complete a verification process. Uh, and for those businesses that require funding, uh, we can look to provide this within uh, 24 hours nine, uh, in terms of a 90% uplift, basically, of that invoice. Uh, so, for example, if you needed £100,000, uh, we could give you £90,000 of that invoice within 24 hours. So that's pretty much how it would work. Um, in terms of the costing, um, there are monthly rolling contracts or a 12-month contract. Um, and there are fixed monthly fees for the facility. Um, you would pay the £15 chaps pan, uh, transfer for the payments that come out. Um, but like I said, obviously, it's a very fair and quick process for us to kind of um, assess. Uh, so if you would like further information on kind of invoice discounting and, and how it works, um, we'll provide our details at the end of the call. And please do get in touch with us um, in terms of hoping cred which kind of support your business going forward. The next topic uh, we wanted to cover was uh, the Barclays Loan for Business. Um, this is a product that Barclays have um, essentially been offering for a number of years. Um, and we have loans available for financing, which can be spread over 20 years um, and a choice of interest rates between fixed or variable. Um, you can take a capital holiday repayment at the start or during the term of the loan. Um, and you can overpay up to 10% a year. Um, the Barclays Loan for Business um, can be potentially applied for through online or through relationship managers like myself and Corbyn. All applications are subject to approval. Um, and like I said before, if, you, if you'd like any further information in terms of how um, any of these loans work, please let us know. I'm going to just hand over to Corbier, who can kind of take you over the flexible commercial mortgage and the rest of the presentation. Okay, thanks for that, Sandy. So um, we can support customers to purchase their commercial premises by way of uh, by way of a commercial mortgage. So what this actually means, it's for those customers that will actually be trading from those premises because we'll use the commercial property as our security. That's the difference between the Barclay for Business, Barclay for Business. Depending on how much you're looking to do, we can act, we can um, take anything as security. If it's a commercial mortgage, owner occupied, we'd be looking to take the actual premises as our bank security. Now, again, a lot of things are very similar to the Bark Loan for Business. Repayments can be spread from between one and 20 years. Um, just bear in mind that generally 20 years tends to be um, for sec depends on is it's very much dependent on industry sector. So we're looking at healthcare probably 20 years. If you're looking at retail or construction, then more likely 15 years. But every sector will have its own um, bank guidelines in terms of what we would look to do. And, and exactly what Sandip says, if you have anything, um, 
pick up the phone, speak to us, and we will see how we can support you. Again, capital repayment holidays available. Um, you, may, you may remember, obviously, with the pandemic, we had lots of business clients where they couldn't keep up their payments. We were able to support them with capital repayment holidays. And what that means is you only cover the interest for that 12 months or six months or however long the repayment holidays for, uh, but the capital remains the same. And at the end of it, uh, you're expected to repay the loan back within the same term. So if you had a 12 month capital repayment holiday, say for example, um, and your loan was over 15 years, then you would be expecting to repay that loan back of over 14 years. Um, I think there's a little bit missing off the bottom there, but I think it just literally that's, um, and that's just to let you know that uh, the difference between the two is taking the commercial uh, commercial property as our as our um, security. So next, just want to talk to you a little bit about um, asset finance. Now Barclays have partnered up with Propel to give business customers access to finance for purchasing assets to acquire equipment vehicles. This particular one is um, proposition is aligned for uh, it's a green proposition aligned to help businesses purchase uh, new green assets. Now those assets can be anything from solar panels, battery storage units, LED lighting, heat pumps, electric uh, vehicle charging points. Um, this will hopefully can help support businesses with their plan to reduce their carbon footprint, because obviously that's quite key now at the moment, lots of businesses um, you know, we're, we're having these conversations about net zero with our customers all the time. So we're, we're just trying to ensure that we actually have propositions which will support their endeavors to reduce their carbon footprint. And um, what our requirement is that, you know, it's an, approved, it's an approved accredited supplier. We can lend up to a maximum of um, 60 months, up to five years. And all we require is that you have a 10% deposit to put down. Um, and it's just moving on to the next bit. So this again is, um, and in, in addition to the following on from the green proposition, we also have asset finance to purchase electric vehicles. Now this is even if you're looking to purchase, um, you know, petrol or diesel cars, we still can uh, we can still support with asset finance. It just won't be the electric proposition. That's all. But otherwise, what this allows you to do, this allows you to purchase an asset without having to, without having a capital. <laughs> The outset and um, you're using up your you're not using up your cash so you can use that within your business to support your to support your cash flow you're spreading the cost of a purchase with the latest sorry oh. um sorry apologies for that and um, obviously we have a range of um solutions that are available in terms of flexible repayments and we have an account manager within propel that would look after your that will look after your uh, your needs and they literally can you you'll do an application they will put it through to their underwriters and we can actually get the funds out to you within within about three days i think the fastest we've done i recently had a client who um and it was a bakery and they were looking to grow and expand their business and they had and they and they needed to purchase a number of assets a proving drawer they needed to purchase industrial dishwasher and some extra additional ovens. And we were, we've were we actually funded four lots of additional asset purchases over the last 12 months for them. And the good thing about this is we're actually using the asset as a security. So you don't need to provide any additional, don't need to provide any additional security. So just in terms of what, what, um, and what this is not a great slide because it's on, uh, because it's on a mobile, but what we can do is, as well as uh, purchasing the, the bigger ticket items, so the bars, the coaches, the vans, plant and machinery. We can also do the soft um, items as well. So IT, hardware, software, even things like retail shop fit outs, fixtures and fittings, um, um, just a range of things. So don't be put off. What I'd say to you is make sure that um, just reach out to us. In terms of who can, who's eligible to apply for these, it's for any, any limited company, sole trader, partnership, even um, uh, some registered charities if they need to. And um, one final thing I did want to actually mention, which kind of slipped my mind is, when you're looking at, um, if you actually have a number of assets that you already own and they are unencumbered, so no finance on it, but they show on your balance sheet, then we can also potentially release cash against those. So we can actually provide cash against those assets that you currently own already. So it doesn't necessarily need to be a new purchase, which can then release cash 
um, to invest in your business, whether that's, you know, whether that's just for your cash flow or anything else that you need. In order to apply, um, you just need to contact your relationship point or pick up the phone, speak to Sandy or myself. We will share our details. And again, it's um, subject to application um, and terms and conditions will apply. Um, that's pretty much it for, for me. If you have any questions, happy to answer them at the end of the final presentation. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very, very much, Barclays PLC. And finally, keeping us on track, we have Richard Middleton for our HM advisory. Um, the stage is yours, Richard. I'm trying to share my screen at the moment. It's saying it cut right. So let's try there we again. Go. We're there, I think. You're there. You're, you're absolutely there. Well done. Okay, good. Time to move it on to the next one. I'm struggling to Alan to actually move it move it on to the next. Uh, I'm going to stop the share and share again. Okay, your your, cut, your arrows on your keyboard might be able to get you for the next. Yeah, I've tried if, that. If you use your mouse, click on your screen and then use your arrows. Just click on um, the PowerPoint. Ah, there you go. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Right. Okay. Um, I'll obviously talk quickly. Uh, so I appreciate we're we're running tight on time. Uh, so so I'm Richard Middleton. Um, forty odd years. Um, as a as a city banker, I've worked for Barclays amongst the other banks. Uh, I've worked for four four different uh, commercial banks. I'm the senior debt advisory partner. Um, for bank brokers here in the UK, we we serve about three thousand clients and have been for in excess of um the last decade. We're involved in all sorts of stuff on the banking side, but largely, um, uh, from my perspective, debt raising, restructuring, renegotiations, rene pricing, covenants, ref refinancing, acquisition finance, etc. Um, we are completely independent, and we are paid um, by the client largely, largely on success. Um, we have relationships, though, with um, all the major banks, and indeed many others as well. Um, in terms of the current market appetite, I think it's fair to say, you know, we are getting a um, lot. We are seeing more and more um, uh, businesses who are unable to um, to get you know traditional bank finance, um, and I think that really is the you know from from their from their main clearer. And I think the reality of that is 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 that um, there is caution out there. There's obviously a lot of fears of, of recession. Um, there's a past banking crisis, of course. Interest rates are, um, you know, at five and a quarter. You know, it's kind of almost like an even bet as to whether it got a five and a half. Um, <clears throat> you know, sort of uh, later today, um, you know, inflation is still still high. Um, you know, there there are a lot of headwinds there, and I mean, obviously, as you would reasonably expect, the banks are looking looking at that. Um, and and that is affecting the, the caution, particularly on a sector by sector basis, um, and certainly in the SME sector, you know that that will you know be particularly uh, keenly felt. So are all banks the same? I think the answer is yes and no. Um, in in reality, um, I think the the um, you know the reality is that no no bank is going to want to lend to someone who can't repay them. I mean you know that's pretty obvious. Um, but some banks have greater appetite. And then particularly in, in, in certain sectors and, and indeed where they have you know, particular expertise. Um, I would say that some bankers, as opposed to banks, are more, more um, uh, proactive than others. I mean, as you'd expect, because I mean, at the end of the day, there are literally thousands of bankers out there. And in fact, there are in the London market alone estimated to be around 250 in, uh, lenders you know, in terms of institutional lenders. Um, I wouldn't profess to know them all. I probably know about 50 of them. Um, so it's a mere fifth. Um, it's fair to say as well that, that a high street lender will generally want the clearing or transactional banking uh, business as well as the, the lending. Um, and that actually may also act as a bit of a, a blocker at times in terms of, you know, if you want to include a secondary bank who probably don't actually want to take on or indeed do not have the capacity in many cases, to take on the clearing or, or relationship banking. 
The secondary bank, banking market, though, is certainly booming. Um, and, and I would say there's probably little difference in true appetite between them, unless you're in a particularly popular sector. For example, recruitment um, is, is a popular sector. Property is because of the assets, um, despite the headrooms, te headwinds, technology, um, anything where there's a social impact um, as well. And there were other ones as well. I mean, professionals tend to always be a um, particularly popular sector. Um, I think the differences where, where they exist can often be in the in ratios in terms of, you know, how much will be lent. And, and I think also specifically, um, you, some secondary lenders will, will look at projected um, performance, um, you know, as opposed to historic. And I'm, you know, I'm, certainly I've got a number of mandates on at the moment where we're actually looking at, you know, finding lenders who will lend on projected, albeit stronger, as you might imagine, um, performance rather than, um, you know, on, on some of the perhaps weaker historic performance. And, you know, the kind of pros and cons on that. But I mean, it's fair to say that if you 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 probably will pay a higher margin for that increased risk. And bearing in mind that, you know, the base rate, as I say, at five and a quarter percent at the moment, you know, that rate could be, you know, sort of, you know, anything from three, four percent margin on top all the way up to 10 plus percent, depending on the, the sort of risks. I mean, obviously, there are tentatives to debt finance and, and a number of, um, you know, people on you know speakers already co covered that but i think i think you know it's fair to say you know there, there is a lot in terms of um you know potentially funds managed you know for cap you know sort of capital funds managed they tend to be on specific sectors you pay a lot for you know for those um you know we've got a whole list of those that we refer um but they're very you know sort of sector driven let's say things like renewables um you know is a particularly in, uh, important area as is tech um in in that there's obviously various government agency funds and quasi government agency funds. And, and I mean, obviously, we've also talked to another government, but, you know, the British Business Bank uh, about that. Um, and there's also Innovate out there, you know, for te technological pro uh, products. And then you've got the Angel Investors, which was touched on by um, a, another uh, colleague. So I won't go into that. Family offices, which also fall into that Angel Investor area as well. I think. The caution I would have with that um, is that the, the general view is that they're becoming more and more risk averse. And I mean, that tends to be the thing that comes back to us all the time. So even even, you know, if somebody's taking equity or quasi equity, um, you know, mezzanine um, sort of risk, they generally are going to you know sort of have less of a risk appetite and the multiples that they lend will be less than they were only only perhaps a couple of years ago. Um, and you will lose a degree of control or ownership for that. And they're becoming increasingly expensive as well. So something to bear in mind. Um, I think in terms of the outlook, just very quickly, um, I, I mean, obviously, I don't have a crystal ball. I think caution is likely to continue, though. Um, I mean, you know, I think current, current economic outlook is certainly uncertain. I mean, you read contradictory stuff all the time um, on this. I mean, obviously, with a general election, probably just over a year's time as well. I mean, you know, that that will actually add to that uncertainty. I think the the only other bits that I just wanted to finish on, if I may, Alan, I appreciate we're running close to time, um, is that I think the common things that I would say is, and this hasn't really changed, and it's common sense, really, but please engage with any lenders or investors on a regular basis. They hate surprises. Um, I think you need to make sure you have a well thought out business plan. And you'll be able to justify and flex any sort of changes in, in the model and be clear on your strategy and goals. In terms of further help and support, well, I mean, obviously, there's the professional help. I mean, you've, you've had a lot of professional advisors on today, including ourselves. There's also a lot of free advice as well, um, you, know, I, you, you know, at a local level. Um, local business groups and forums, for example. I mean, I live in uh, I live in West London. Um, I um, go to the, I mean, the one I go to is the Spellthorn Business Forum. Um, advice there, I mean, it's limited, but it's, you know, in terms of the time that you get, um, but they will give you advice on things like business planning, preparation of applications, coaching and mentoring, and also an up-to-date view on the ever-changing range of grants available so look alan i've spoken at speed um whistle stop tour that that's it from me and if there's time for questions happy to take any bingo look at that bang on 11 o'clock we finished his final breath um i I'm, I'm going to wrap this up a little bit because fortunately we don't have any questions in the q a box i've put a note in the chat box 
there. Oh, look, just like magic, one pops up. Um, uh, a question from our friend Robin Cairns. Um, a question uh, from for David, who was hoping he would get a question. I know he was. <laughs> yeah. Um, when we contacted your bank following discussions with Vince Cable, we were told you only lend to one uh one million pounds existing turnover. Um, presumably that's changed quite a bit since then. Because that's a number of years ago. How long has the business British Business Bank been running? Uh, twenty twelve, in its okay. in its original format. So eleven years now. Mm -hmm. uh, and is there a, a minimum turnover that the company can have to so, be able to apply? Because we're not FCA regulated or authorized, you can't approach us directly and ask us for money. We're we're legally not allowed to do that. It has right. to go through the delivery oh, partners. The yeah. Um. So the it depends on what program you want to access and it depends on what delivery partner you want to go through but different programs have different criteria. there's not enough time to run through all of them so so basically what i'm suggesting is that if you want to access if you go on our website it will tell you the programs and what they do and who delivers each program so if you want to access one of the programs find the delivery partner and you need to go through them legally to access finance you can't come to us right we're just not allowed to do it understand thank you very much david um I, I would actually like to wrap this up by saying um there's all different types of finance options out there and the best thing to do if your company is getting into um issues needs finance and wants advice uh, is come along to a trade association first like a chamber of commerce or our good friends at spellthorn um uh business uh, just across the water um, where where we know them very well and do some joint events with them. Um, Spellthorn Business Forum, sorry, make the words too late escape me for a moment. Um, we um, can always, if not give you the advice directly, um, point you in the right direction to get good quality advice and different options for that advice, whether it's from a bank directly or whether it's from a financial advisor. Um, or whether it's from a good quality accountant. Come and talk to us first. That, that's your best neutral port of call, and we can direct you in different ways. I'm, I'm very grateful, especially for David Woods, to come along and talk to us directly from the British Business Bank today. Um, to engage with them, as he says, you need to engage via one of their supply chain partners, as it were, um, on the high street, and we can point you in the direction, or you can visit their website, to see who their delivery partners are. Um, for today, um, I thank you all very, very much for attending. We have a, a live event at um, David Lloyd Centre in Acton tomorrow as a business breakfast. Please have a look at our website for um, times and to register. We've also got um, some visitors from New Zealand coming next week for a gin on vodka tasting evening. Um, if that should cheer you up on a Tuesday evening, please come along. Uh, otherwise, I express my enormous gratitude to all of our speakers today. Um, thank you all very much for joining us today. Hope you all have a, a wonderful rest of the day and the sun shines on you all. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, Thanks guys. guys.